the laptop here. Good evening. My name is Marina Silianu, and I am a student supervisor and project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College was founded on the unceded territory of the Susquehannock peoples. We hereby recognize the prior status and enduring diversity of this land and the many indigenous nations that stand in relation to it, particularly the thousands of indigenous children from dozens of different nations forced or coerced into the reprogramming camp established at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879. Dickinson endorsed and gave material support to these cultural eradication efforts. Turn of the 20th century presidents facilitated land acquisition and charitable donations while others conferred honorary degrees to two Carlisle Indian Industrial School superintendents. Dickinson faculty delivered lectures and classes at both the Carlisle Indian Industrial School and on campus. This relationship represents our failure to have recognized in these people and their nations different, but no less self-sovereign ways of thinking, living, and being. We recognize and take responsibility for the college's support for this attempted eradication of indigenous peoples, a profound moral failing at, in stark opposition to our mission today. No single acknowledgement is sufficient to the task before us. Accordingly, this living land acknowledgement is incomplete by design and under revision by necessity. It reflects our need and desire to learn from these histories and the indigenous communities that carry them. To act consciously and responsibly with that knowledge and to sustain our commitment to this process by regularly reviewing it. While our knowledge remains incomplete, the process of turning honestly toward our history continues to animate our acknowledgement today, even as it orients us to a more just tomorrow. The violence of settlement and forced relocations of tribal nations and the cultural erasure program at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School are stories we must recognize, share, and attempt to reconcile with our own. Yet, these histories do not diminish the ongoing stories, continuing sovereignty, and enduring strength of indigenous nations and people. The interrelated histories of this land lean firmly against easy characterization and the comforting simplicity of a single story. We thus offer this in-process living land acknowledgement with deep humility to the many and varied indigenous nations and peoples who, by choice or force, called this land home. On behalf of the Clark Forum, the Constance and Rose Geno Memorial Award for Inspirational Teaching, the Department of Philosophy, and the ethics across campus in the curriculum program, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle. Our speaker today is here to speak about the power 
that anger provides in activism. Particularly, she discusses a form of anti-racist anger she calls Lordian rage, taking inspiration from the works of Audre Lorde. Lordian rage is a force for good, as it motivates change and builds resistance while providing a liberating perspective. Rather than continuing to dismiss anger, particularly the anger of people of color, we are challenged to both welcome and use anger in the pursuit of racial justice. This semester, I am taking a class called Speaking and Writing Across Difference, known more colloquially as Dialogues Across Differences. This class, focused on training for the participation and facilitation of dialogues, challenges my ideas about what it means to have a meaningful conversation. So often, we dismiss rage and passion in the name of civility, because recognizing the emotional component of social and political issues is uncomfortable. However, by removing the humanity of emotion from these conversations, we often reinforce the systems of oppression which produce anger in marginalized groups. As our speaker argues, we must open ourselves and our dialogues to our emotions and the emotions of others, particularly if that emotion is rage. Maisha Cherry is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. Her research primarily focuses on the role of emotions and attitudes in public life. She is also the director of the Emotion and Society Lab and hosts the Unmute podcast, where she interviews philosophers about current social and political issues. Professor Cherry's books include Unmuted, Conversations on Prejudice, Oppression, and Social Justice, which she co-edited with Owen Flanagan. The Moral Psychology of Anger, and her most recent work to date, and the subject of tonight's talk, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle. Her work on emotions and rage, apologies, race, uh, has appeared in publications such as The Atlantic, Boston Review, Huffington Post, and New Philosopher Magazine, among many others. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speaker, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speaker and everyone in attendance, please stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. There will be a book sale and signing in the lobby immediately following the program. In the event of an emergency, please note that accessible exits are located on the west side of the building. At this time, I ask that you silence all cell phones and electronic devices. And now, please, wel please join me in welcoming Professor Maisha Cherry. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all so much, the organizers, for putting this event together. Thank you all so much for, for coming out on a tonight Thursday, on a Thursday night. Um, the rain tried to get in our way, tried to give you all an excuse, but I'm so glad that it went away and we can all be here, be here together. So I've had a wonderful uh, day with students, uh, very fruitful conversations, and I cannot wait to continue that conversation with you all, with you all tonight. All right, so let's get to it. So I, I wrote this book in 2021. Uh, the Case for Rage. And I wrote the book primarily because I began to notice that out of all the emotions that we have, there was one particular emotion that we had a tendency or have a tendency to view as just one thing. And the way that I describe it is that when it comes to anger, we have a tendency to paint anger in, in broad strokes. All right. um, not only is this the move that we make I guess in our contemporary public discourse, in our private conversations. But there's a long history in Eastern traditions and in the Western tradition, and also not only in philo philosophical traditions, but also in psychological traditions of doing, of doing this. I want to give you all an example of, of what I'm talking about. Usually this characterization that's painted in broad strokes is people uh, perceive of 
or think of anger as an evil emotion, something that is, that is very bad. And this is a, a pop culture reference. This is Dr. Evil, and I understand that the students in the room probably have no idea who this is. <laughs> so I need to like replace this with a more like a millennial kind of characterization. Uh, but you get the point, right? We tend to think that anger is one thing, and that one thing is it's evil, it's evil, it's evil, it's evil. OK. So, so here's an example of this, this, this painting in broad strokes in the Eastern tradition. Um, so a Buddhist sage quotes, the mind does not get peace, nor enjoy pleasure and happiness, nor find sleep or satisfaction when the dart of anger rests in the heart. Right? So they kind of believe that uh, when one is angry, um, it's, it's kind of incompatible with the peace of mind. Right? Continuation, uh, more recently, Jonathan Haidt, more psychologist, uh, writes, quote, anger comes with an inclination to attack, to humiliate, or otherwise get the person back who is perceived as acting unfairly or immorally. So in the Eastern tradition, is this notion that, that anger impedes kind of well-being in a sense, psychological well-being. And this example by Haidt suggests that not only does it impede psychological well-being, but it also impedes physical well-being, or at least someone else's physical well-being. Because when, when, you, is, when you are angry, uh, you typically, or in his view, have an inclination to, to act that out uh, through, through attacks. Philosopher Glenn Pettigrove wrote in a 2012 uh, article uh, where he writes, quote, while a person's social position or relational history may make their anger warranted. So he's suggesting, hey, in the context of social injustice, anger is warranted. He writes, that does not necessarily make it wise. So it may be warranted, but it's not a wise feeling to have. And he writes, a close look at anger highlights the need for virtue to correct it, right? Because it, for, in his view, there seemed to be some kind of vicious element. So we need another virtue to make sure that it gets on the right track, because by nature, it uh, can get us off track. And then we have, uh, much more recently, Martha Nussbaum in her 2016 book, Anger and Forgiveness. Uh, she writes that the desire for retribution, this is kind of much connected to Jonathan Haidt's view, um, helps us to see, and this is her words here, the irrationality and stupidity of anger. And she writes that when there is a great injustice, whether that's Black Lives Matter, whether that's LGBT issues, the end goal must remain agape, must remain love. Now, if you agree with any of these thinkers, then you can imagine that if you think that anger impedes psychological and physical well-being, that it's by nature vicious, so much so that you need a virtue to, to correct it. And even in the context of, of injustice, although it may be warranted, it's not wise. If you believe these things, that's going to encourage particular individual action. One particular action is going to encourage, and this is something that Martha Nuzma writes, is that when you have anger, then you're going to feel the need to transition out of that anger, perhaps transition from anger to love. Or you're going to be left with the inclination to say, hey, there's something wrong with my anger. Maybe perhaps I need to replace it with another emotion. Right? Or you're going to feel the need to eliminate it out of your emotional repertoire altogether, if you believe or agree with these particular thinkers. Now, I don't agree with these thinkers. <laughs> um, and I'm very much persuaded. I mean, this is not a, a kind of a new th idea. Uh, David Hume, philosopher of the, I guess you could say, 19th century, um, wrote in his treatise on human nature, and this is his words. He says, we are not to imagine that all the angry passions are vicious. Now, this, now think about what he's saying here. He didn't say we are not to imagine that anger is vicious. He says, we are not to imagine that all the angry passions are vicious, which just suggests there's more than one type of anger. Right? The anger is not one thing. And once we realize that anger is not one thing, perhaps we can isolate the vicious and the virtuous kinds. So reading David Hume in graduate school led me, or at least motivated me, to begin to look at anger in its varieties, as opposed to pain and anger in broad strokes, I begin to see that anger has varieties to it. And I want to convince you, or at least uh, challenge you, to begin to see anger in all its varieties. So I want to make a case for rage, and I'm going to make it in several parts. 
And so the first case that I want to make is anger is so much more than you think it is. Anger is so much more than you think it is. So I'm going to quote myself here, if I may. Um, so I write, it, I write in the case for Rachel, quote, that we can focus on the target, the action tendency, and the aim of the anger, as well as the perspective that informs the anger. And if we do, I want to suggest that, that these dimensions, the action tendency, the aim, the perspective, that they are sufficient, they are enough to help us distinguish the varieties of anger, the different kinds of anger. And not only that, it can help us determine if a particular variety is good or bad. And what I mean by that, good or bad, in the sense of being productive or unproductive, particularly when it comes to pursuit of justice. And I want to say for the, the sake of this talk that I'm very just interested in a, uh, anger that arises in the context of, of systemic injustice, particularly racial injustice. So anger is more than you think it is. It is not one thing. And the way that we can see that anger is not one thing is that we can look at the different dimensions and the different features. And those features will help us to identify the different varieties of anger that exist. And by looking at those features, we can therefore come to the conclusion if that anger type itself is bad or good or productive or unproductive. So I just want to throw out, given that, 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 that system, I want to throw out a couple of varieties. And I'm going to throw out, uh, for the sake of this talk, I'll show out kind of two varieties that are unproductive, and then I'll motivate, motivate Lordy and Rage, or, or the kind that I think is productive in, in the context of, of, of justice. So the first variety that I distinguish is, is something that I want to call wipe rage. And I, I want to say that the, the examples that I'm going to give, uh, I'm trying to get us to see these examples in real life, but it's not to suggest that those who inhabit more recently these particular types, that they are exclusive to any particular type of individuals or any particular type of race. But I think examples always help us to imagine, to see the anger in the real world. So I call it wipe rage. Okay. So what is white rage? Well, let's look at the particular dimensions and fill in the blanks. So what is the target of what I'm calling white rage? Well, typically when someone have this particular anger, that the target is usually a scapegoat, All right? So it's never necessarily the person who is causing the injustice, the person or the group um, that is causing the discomfort, um, but it's usually you know, a, a scapegoat, so you can imagine that if there is particular economic policies that's being passed by the government um, that is uh, disenfranchising or, or, or hurting a particular group, that group, instead of getting mad at the political people that are in power, they may think it's because the Mexicans have come to town. Right? So the target is directed at, at, at scapegoats as opposed to the true source. So when one has this particular anger, not only is it target towards scapegoat, there's going to be a, a particular kind of action tendency um, that can have a kind of affective dimension. And so the, the tendency that someone is, is bound to have um, when their anger is targeted at scapegoats is that they're going to have hatred towards these particular individuals. Right? And this hatred towards these particular individuals is also going to lead them to kind of have a tendency that um, these individuals get eliminated. All right? And this elimination can be uh, physical, but it can also be social. Right, so whether those individuals, if we're going to say those Mexicans are taking jobs, well, let's exclude them from um, the economic system, right? or send them back to their particular country. And then there's usually also a kind of thinking, a kind of ideology, a kind of perspective that's going to influence or inform the kind of anger that a person has. So in the case of white rage, you know, you kind of imagine what would get people to, to, to allow their anger to be targeted scapegoats, hating other individuals, seeking to eliminate these particular individuals. Well, you can think that when you have kind of a zero-sum way of thinking, right? Where you think, well, if they win, then I, you know, I lose. Right? And if I win, then they lose, right? As opposed to thinking that there's a surplus of, of justice and equality that can be distributed, right? Okay. Another kind of anger that I, that I distinguish is something that I call narcissistic rage. And I get this from uh, the writer Bell Hooks. And this is a, a kind of rage that she mentions in her popular uh, essay collection called Killing Rage. So what is narcissistic rage? What are the, the features here? Well, what is the target of narcissistic rage? 
Well, usually the target of narcissistic rage is that it's kind of different than white rage, so you're not necessarily targeting it as scapegoats. But you're targeting at those, or your anger is directed at those people who are harming you, right? So those that target that particular individual who are angry is who their anger will be directed at. So you might think, well, Maisha, I mean, that means that their anger is apt. That means that it's fitting. But you'll see here on the slide here, I said that that's a narrow way of thinking. So remember I told you that I'm very interested in the context of injustice, societal and political um, injustice. And we know societal and political injustice is never about one individual, right? It's a response or is a systemic problem. But individuals who have narcissistic rage, they only get angry when that systemic problem, what we call a systemic problem, when they encounter that problem in their day-to-day -day lives. And they may be completely oblivious or completely indifferent to how that affects other people. Here, so here's an, here's an example. So Bell Hooks gives an, gives an example in her book where she talks about a group of black elites, and I think she's basing this on um, a, a kind of a, a, a real occurrence that happened and it was in the news. But she talks about how a group of black elites were, were traveling in a car and they get pulled over by the, the, by the police. And uh, I think they were probably po politicians. And these politicians had never spoken out about police brutality at all until they, get, until they got pulled over by the police. And so they're angry about uh, them getting pulled over by the police. And she says they're angry not because there's a problem of police brutality or driving while black. They're angry because they got pulled over. Right, so the, the focus is quite, is quite narrow. And I think the second point is going to connect to this. I mean, the tendency that usually occurs is that they're so focused, the focus is so much on how they were mistreated that they're kind of indifferent to how other people are treated. Right, so the fact that it's a systemic issue is completely irrelevant. The problem is, is that they are the ones who was a victim to the injustice. And connected to this has to do with an idea of hierarchical kind of thinking, and their anger becomes kind of an expression of this hierarchical thinking, right? So if you are a black elite who gets pulled over by the police and you are experiencing narcissistic rage, then your anger is basically directed at the fact that you can stop poor black people, but how dare you stop me with a good professor job at Dickinson, right? And so the anger becomes an expression of, 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 of hierarchy, indifferent to other people who, who suffered on a day-to-day -day basis who is not them. So you think about it, if it's targeted in this particular way, if the action tendency is this particular thing and the tendency is an expression of hierarchy, then you can imagine that the kind of, you know, kind of perspective that is in influencing this kind of thinking or this ideology is kind of an excessive kind of self-importance. Right? That there's something about, special about you um, that demands a kind of respect that other people does not demand. Right? So excessive. Self-importance is kind of informing um, the anger. And you can imagine that both of these angers are not going to get us closer to any kind of transformation in our world in which equality um, and justice is, is, is the standard. And so that's why I compare that and contrast that with what I'm going to call uh, Lodian rage. And Lodian rage is uh, an account of anger that is kind of uttered earlier today, um, influenced by, by the work of, of Audre Lorde, particularly her famous essay, The Uses of, of, of Anger. So what is loading a rage, and how does it contrast with those two other kinds of varieties, and what makes it distinct? And more importantly, what makes it the thing that we need, or the thing that is essential, or the thing that is beneficial when it comes to fighting against injustice, particularly in our case, racial injustice. So, Loading on rage, what is its target? Well, its target is racism. Racists, those who are complicit in racism. Structural injustice, we can go on and on and on. So it's not scapegoats, right? Nor is it just that person in, in, in which uh, targeted you. It's, it's, it's systemic, right? And it's very precise in which is racism, racist attitudes, complicity in racism, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So Adjilor writes, she says, my response to racism is anger. And she says that that anger has eaten clips into my living only when it has remained unspoken. And she's very unapologetic about this. 
And she begins the essay kind of defining what, what racism is. Right? And she says her anger that she's going to defend in her essay is a response to, to, to that. OK. Now, what is the action tendency? What is one prone to do when one has this particular anger? Well, it's not hatred. It's not elimination of, of other people. When one has this particular anger, one has a tendency to explore it. Right. One has a tendency to explore it, trying to figure out, um, explore it for epistemic benefits, explore it for knowledge. What does this anger say about my world? What does this anger say about me? What does that anger say about my, my, the way in pe which people perceive me in this particular world? Right. So the tendency to, is, is, is exploration. In addition, not only is exploration a, a tendency, and the feminist philosophers, borrowing from Audre Lorde, has kind of talked about this notion that, that, that anger is loaded with information, this is Audre Lorde's quote. It's loaded with information because it can give us answers to the questions that we have. But in addition to that, not only is a tendency for us to explore um, and to examine the anger, but also the tendency is to metabolize it, right? Use it for energy, use it as a, as a catalyst. But what for? Well, Audre Lorde, in, in referring to uh, metabolizing and using this for en energy, one of the things she says um, is that anger, everything can be used except what is wasteful. And she says, you would need to remember this when you are accused of destruction. And she's particularly talking about anger. Anger can be used. It can be me metabolized. And, and it's as if she's reminding us that not everybody's going to be happy about it, about your anger. Some people are going to tell you that it's bad, that it's unproductive. But she reminds us, everything can be used. Even anger can be used. Remember that it's useful, even when people accuse you of being destructive, violent, vicious, when you have the, when you have the emotion. And the aim, and the reason why it can be useful, is because the aim of this anger is change. More particular, the way that R.G. Lawrence describes it, she describes change as a radical transformation of our world. A radical transformation of our world. OK. And the perspective that influences it, the thinking that informs this particular anger, that makes it different from the other angry, angry types, is this kind of inclusive kind of way of thinking. And that's why the anger that I'm talking about is not just for individuals that are the direct victims of oppression. Right? It can be for anyone in the polity who's in solidarity with them. It's this perspective that I am not free until everyone is free. So freedom is necessary not just for me. It's what makes it different from narcissistic rage, but it's necessary for everyone. And Adjula writes that I am not free while any woman is unfree even when her shackles are different from my own. And I am not free as long as one person of color remains chained, nor is any one of you. And you can imagine here that if a kind of anger that has these particular features, these dimensions that I just described, if there exists a variety, like I'm suggesting that it is, which is loading a rage, then what is the action that we should engage in? Right? If not every instance of anger is the narcissistic kind, if not every instance of anger is the white kind, that there can exist loading and rage, then what is the action that we should take? Well, I think this should be a good way to remind us that, hey, we can, we can, we can keep our anger. We don't have to get rid of it. We can also cultivate it, right? making sure that even when it dis wants to go to the white rage kind of category, we can make sure that it stays on track to the Lordian. Right? It has the ability to be cultivated. If anger does indeed look like this in the ways in which Audre Lorde has described it, then we should stand guard against people telling us that it's bad, or that it's useless, or that we should give it up. And we should use it using the ways that Adjula was very optimistic about, that is, aiming it towards change. OK, so that's the first part of, of my case. The anger is so much more than you think it is. 
that anger is not one type, and we can distinguish if we encounter a, you know, an instance of anger or we experience an anger ourselves, we can ask ourselves the question, okay, what, do, what am I aiming at? What is this target? What, what do I feel like doing? All right, what am I aiming at? And by answering that question, you'll know if your anger is productive or unproductive, if you need to cultivate it or if you need to get rid of it. And I want to say that as much as people would like us to think that all instances of anger is the first kinds, I want to suggest, no, a lot of us do experience loading rage in the room. And if you have experienced it, if you know people who have experienced it, we need to encourage them to keep it, cultivate it, stand guard against it, and, and to use it. If you're not convinced yet, here's the second part of my case. <laughs> So not only is there more than one kind of anger, that anger is more than you think it is, but anger can also fuel positive action. The positive is very, very important here. All right. And I'm particularly talking about, now you kind of know that the rage that I'm making a case for is the Lorian kind. <laughs> And this Lordian kind can, can, can fuel positive action. Now, this part of the case is, is not, or has not come about due to armchair reflection. <laughs> There's a lot of empirical evidence that kind of backs up this particular part of the case. And the fueling aspect of, of the argument has to do with what goes on in our brains when we are experiencing anger. So these are not my studies. I'm basically borrowing um, from people who have engaged in these particular studies. So one of the things that, that social psychologists um, have came to the conclusion of is that when you are angry, it makes you very optimistic. Right. Another way of saying this is that when you are angry, you honestly believe things can change. Okay. You believe that things can change. So anger makes you optimistic. Thing that these researchers have concluded is that being angry also increases your self-belief. So not only do you believe that things can change, but you also believe that you can change things. This is what happens when you're angry. And then also, anger makes you less risk averse. Makes you willing to engage in actions despite the risk. Now, some of you may not be convinced by this. And I think the best example to give you of how these three elements really appear in real life, let me just spend 30 seconds talking about January 6th. Now, I said that these studies are not lording and rageous studies, right? That anger, just in general, makes you less risk averse, makes you optimistic, and it also makes you, increases your self-belief. Of course it does. If the folks at the Capitol were indeed angry, then they honestly believed that they could stop the election. I mean, okay, okay, that explains things. <laughs> and that they could stop the election. Oh, yeah, 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 explain things. And as I was watching, I just couldn't believe these people really was going into the Capitol. I mean, it really makes them less risk averse. I mean, that's just a, I mean, they're paying the, the penalty now, but, you know. Well, that's what happens when you're angry. Now here's a, here's a, a cautionary tale. When you don't have the, the Lordian kind, it can lead you to engage in some action that's not so productive that can give you 22 years, right? But I'm talking about the case for Lordian rage, so let's, let's get back on that. Okay, so let me give you another example. Forget January 6th. I think, I think when I think about Lordian rage and I think about historical figures, um, freedom fighters who have had Lordian rage, I think this makes sense, right, that, that if, if that if loading and rage can fuel productive action, it makes you less risk averse, it makes you optimistic, and increases your self-belief. It really helps me make sense of two women that I admire. So on the left, we have Sojourner Truth, and to the right, we have Ida B. Wells. Both of these individuals born in slavery, and what both of these individuals will do, live their lives speaking truth to power. All right. So we know Sojourner Truth uh, was a feminist, <laughs> and fall for the, the rights of, of black women. And we know Ida B. Wells, likewise, and one of, one of the things that she's most popular for is the anti-lynching campaign. I mean, this is a woman, um, 1800s, early 1900s, 
who had a, a newspaper and was just telling people off, <laughs> um, trying to enlighten people about what was happening to black folks throughout this country in regards to lynching. So much so, she was so much a threat that they burned her press down. But she kept going. Traveled throughout Europe talking about anti-lynching alone. Right? And you gotta kinda think about how could these women born into slavery have the audacity to speak truth to power and live their lives to work towards justice and to work towards freedom? And, and my answer in the archives kinda back this up is that, oh, it's their anger. Right? That it was through their anger at oppression that made them less risk-averse, that made them optimistic and increased their self-belief. I mean, just imagine the kind of self-belief you have to have to be a black woman fighting for change during this period of time. Now, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a quote of Ida B. Wells' biographer kind of supporting this claim that I'm making. And uh, they write, Wells raised often angry questions about racism and inequality in the United States. She demanded practical answers to questions posed in the spirit of Isaiah and Jeremiah, biblical prophets, whose exhortations sometimes began with a sardonic ha, like the prophet's passion for Zion. Wells' visionary pragmatism was shaped by a righteous rage that was also part of the work of love. Anger explains it. And just as it fueled them, it has fueled lots of people after them, and perhaps has fueled a lot of people in this room. Now, speaking of this love point, <laughs> um, someone might be thinking, well, Professor Chair, you gotta talk about other emotions. So, so, so if you're gonna bring out love, why aren't you making a case for love? That's what we should be talking about, All right? Well, I want to say that typically when people pose this question about, hey, what about love? Let's talk about love. Let's not talk about anger. They usually have the, the thinking that emotions, positive emotions, such as love, such as compassion, is incompatible with love, as if you can't have both operating at the same time. And I want to say that, that Love and compassion and all these other positive emotions, and we call them positive emotions not necessarily because they feel good, but because they have a negative kind of view or ne negative perspective or evaluation about who it's directed at. And the reason why we think that love and compassion is, 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 is incompatible with love has to do with the kind of broad strokes, broad strokes view that we have, right? But I wanna say that they're compatible. Usually when people are angry, they are angry because they have empathized with other people's oppression. Right? And they are compassion, they are co-suffering with them. And if you co-suffer with someone who's a victim of injustice, kind of what you're gonna be feeling is indeed anger. So compassion and anger is compatible. Right? If you love freedom, if you love black people, if you love immigrants, then if you see that they're being abused, then your response is going to be anger. So love and anger is compatible. They are compatible. Now it's interesting, because usually when I make this point, you may be thinking, but Martin Luther King, he's usually like the objection here. OK, Martin Luther King is always the objection when it comes to you know, one's activism or one's protest not looking a certain kind of way. People always bring up Martin Luther King. So people always say, well, Martin Luther King, he taught a love ethic. And I don't know what Martin Luther King would say about what you have to be saying about anger. As if Martin Luther King was never angry. As if Martin Luther King never said anything insightful about anger. So I, I, I just want to kind of briefly kind of disentangle uh, or, or debunk the myth that Martin Luther King's life and his work is a counter argument to what I'm claiming today. Because if you really look at the life of Martin Luther King, You'll know that anger was a fuel for him, and he wanted anger to be a fuel for young folks. So here's an example. So the very famous letter from a Birmingham jail, you all familiar with that letter that King writes in the Alabama jail. And he wrote that not because he was feeling good one day in a jail cell. <laughs> and he just, you know, he got inspired. The story goes that his lawyer, as he's sitting in the, the jail, do a violation of an injunction for them not to, not to march, his lawyer comes to him and, and, and gives him a letter. And this is an open letter that was written by eight white clergymen. 
And they basically write a letter, basically opposing King being in town, his tactics, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Now King, he, he was a minister. He felt some kind of way about these clergymen writing this particular letter. And the way that his lawyer describes him, it was like he was pissed off. He was livid. He was, okay, his lawyer didn't say that. He was very, 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 very angry, right? And he says that as a result of that letter and his anger in response to that, he just writes in you know, scraps of, of paper, bubble gum, all, anything that he can find in his jail cell, he began to write the letter from a Birmingham jail. And so today, I, I even use it in my you know, political philosophy course. It's a wonderful piece of political philosophy. But please know that wonderful piece of political philosophy wasn't just written out of love. It was written out of anger. So even King uses anger for, for good, and anger fueled that beautiful, that beautiful letter. Then there's a, a um, and in one of his collections of, of essays, there's a speech that he gives that's basically a celebration of the life of W.E. Du Bois. You all know that W.E. Du Bois passes away the eve of the March on Washington. And Martin Luther King is basically talking about the life and the legacy of W.E. Du Bois. And when he's, um, Pinning these words, the, you know, the time of the period is like young folks are very, you know, discontent. They're very anxious. They're restless. And this is happening during the time that one might say kind of the beginning of the black power movement, right? Um, and Martin Luther King wants to speak to these young people. And you would think if he was so much against anger, I thought that anger was just incompatible with love and compassion, you would think he'd tell those young people not to be angry. But when you read the essay, he basically says, you know, be angry. But come on and join our movement. And we'll show you basically how to, to use that anger in, in healthy ways, in good ways. And he uses W. Du Bois' life as an example of someone who engaged in action. He wasn't just feeling things, but he engaged in, in action, right? And so as much as people bring him up as a counterexample, I think King's life and his work reminds me the anger is not necessarily bad because he was able to use anger in his own individual life. And he was also, you know, never in any of his writings does he tell young people, does he tell colleagues not to be ang ang angry. He felt that anger without action was just useless, right? And what he wanted young people to do is to put some action behind that anger and that action directed towards justice and, and freedom, freedom fighting. Okay. The third case I want to make in relationship to lowering a rage is that not only is it more than we think it is, not only does it fuel positive action, but through anger we can also break what I'm going to call racial rules. Now, I don't have much time to kind of cover this, and this is kind of like bait for you all to buy the book that's outside, um, but I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to cover this as, as, as comprehensively as, as, I, as I can. So a lot of people who work on emotions and, and at the intersection of race and gender, what they've kind of come to the conclusion of is that when they think about the world, and there's no doubt that a lot of you all perhaps will agree with, with, with this quote here, that they realize that there are just different rules for different racialized bodies. And particularly what they have come to the conclusion of is the rules that they've been very much interested in has to do with feelings. So this is, they, they basically have argued that based on the kind of body that you have kind of dictates the kind of affective or emotive response that you ought to have in the world. So the thinking, when it relates to gender and race, that as a black woman, the kind of the feeling rule is that you, you can feel anger, but you also to, ought to suppress it. All right. And given the stereotypes that we have about Asian women, for example, is that kind of the, the rule that we have, feeling rule, is that they, also, they ought to be happy even while they're subservient or being oppressed. Right? These are kind of the rules, uh, what we call kind of feeling rules around different kind of racialized bodies. And perhaps you kind of felt these rules in your, in your day to day. Okay. Now, what a lot of thinkers have thought is that, hey, you, but you can break these rules. And we know the best way to break a rule is just not to do what people expect you to do or want you to do. You all know this as young people. So if you want to break that feeling rule, that norm, that stereotype, is as opposed to uh, not feeling anger, a black woman can say, hey, forget that. 
Right? I'm a human being, I'm gonna express my anger. That would be a way to break the rule. And if you are an Asian woman, as opposed to kind of succumbing to the stereotype that I have to have a happy wife to servant, I'm gonna be resentful. That's a way to break that kind of racialized, gendered rule that's full of misogyny and racism. And this is what the law professor Janine Young Kim says. She says, breaking the rule, this feeling rule that I just described. When you do this, she says, it's a form of protest against the shame and the meekness that emotion rules attempt to instill among the racialized. So y'all thought that protest was only about holding up a sign down, down the street, but protest can happen, radical movements can happen, just by what you do with your emotions. Okay, what I think is missing is that I don't just think that there's feeling rules. I think there's a, a more broader category when it comes to race. And I think, kind of riffing off of, of, of Kim here, I think we need to show how and why rage, or why anger is fundamental to the struggle that she's just described. And I think the best way to do that is to theorize what I've called racial rules. Now, I think not only can we break feeling rules, but we can break racial rules. Okay, what are racial rules? Here's a kind of quick description. They are affective, so it's what you feel, behavioral, what you do, they're cognitive, you know, how you think, these rules that exist in society. So they are affective, behavioral, and cognitive rules that people of certain races should follow in a white supremacist or male-dominated society. So it's just a broader category. And I want to just kind of mention two of them today and, and just show you how you can break them by having Lordian and Rage. Okay. So the first rule, just by the picture here, you'll see that it has to do with white men. Sorry to pick on white men today. Um, I'll pick on someone else tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what is, what is one racial rule? One racial rule, I describe it as such, in very biblical Elizabethan language. <laughs> Thou shall not have a right to white male anger. All right. This is a cognitive, affective behavior rule that exists in a white, dom a white supremacist, male-dominated society. Right. And by thou, I mean anyone in here who's not a white, a white male. Okay, so that's the, that's the first racial rule. Now, to understand this rule, you've got to understand the connection between value, respect, and anger. Right. And the thinking goes like this. If you believe that you have value, then you're going to think that you are due a certain kind of level of respect because you think you have value. And if you're not given a certain level of respect, whether that's through just direct disrespect or through being a victim of wrongdoing, then you will be angry and you will have a right to be angry. Why? Because you're responding to dis disrespect and you're responding to being disrespected because you perceive yourself as having value. So value, respect, and anger is very connected. Okay. Now, if you don't think a person has value, then even when they are harmed, you would think that they have no, no kind of need to be respected. And even if they get angry against the treatment that's happening to them, you would think that they would not have a right to anger. You all see how I'm going here. All right. So individuals that we don't think have value, we don't think that they do respect, and no matter what we do to them, you will be confused of why they will be angry at your mistreatment of them. So this explains, particularly when I think about kind of the Kavanaugh here, people just understood why they were angry. Look at this man, he worked hard for his law degree, right? Went to Harvard, done well, forget what he did as a kid, right? And it's like, he's entitled to this job. And the fact that this opposition is happening towards him is disrespectful. He has value, he's feel like he's being disrespected with these claims, and as a result, he has a right to anger. So anger is typically regarded as the right of, of, of white men in our society, particularly because we think that they have value, and therefore claims to respect, and anyone who challenges that respect, then they have a right to be angry at them. And this helps us explain why we don't understand the anger of the mistreatment of black women. Right? When you think that you don't have value even though you bring a lot of money to the Tennis Association, 
When you think that you don't have value, you should just surrender to whatever the police tells you to do. That is Sandra Bland. Right, whatever, uh, any sexual harassment claims that you're having, when you don't think you have a right, when people think that you're not valuable, then people would think that you're just targets of being disrespected. But that disrespect doesn't count as disrespect, and they will be confused about why people will be angry at such mistreatment. And they would think that you'd have no claims to anger because they don't think that you have any kind of value. I think an example of this comes out of the mouth of a white man. So when Officer Darren Wilson was shooting Michael Brown, this is how he describes the incident. He says, he, that is Michael Brown, looked up at me and had the most intense, aggressive face. The only way that I can describe it, it looks like a demon. That's how angry he looked. And just to be clear, I know this happened a few years ago, and our memories, you know, we forget things that didn't happen within the last 48 hours. Darren Wilson is describing him shooting unarmed black man, Michael Brown. And he says that as a result of shooting Michael Brown, he had an aggressive face, he looked like a demon, and that's how angry he looked. He's confused about why Michael Brown would be angry at him for shooting him. And he says he was almost bulking up to run through the shots like it was making him mad that I'm shooting him. When you don't respect <laughs> or think that a life is valuable, you would not understand why they would have any claims to respect and you would not therefore understand or think that they have a right to be angry. So there's a way to break <laughs> this racial rule and a way of breaking the racial rule is understanding the aspects of the rule. So an uh, aspect of the rule is accept the lack of value of black life, or Mexican life, or immigrant life, or women's life. But you can break that rule. When you have lonely and rage, you basically say, I don't accept that message. All right, I'm going to have anger because I value my life. I value the lives of people that I'm in solidarity with. One aspect of the rule is, if you are angry, just suppress it. Well, you can break that rule right, by expressing it. An aspect of the rule says, hey, act respectable or you'll be punished. Well, you can break that rule. Because when you have loading and rage, you take the risk. Even uh, the risk of people you know, fulfilling a particular stereotype, et cetera, et cetera, you take the risk. So to me, I think this explains, explains a lot, right? This, this connection between value, respect, anger. And the fact that despite those particular aspects, that when you decide to be angry in spite of that kind of uh, structure, you're doing something radical. You're doing something revolutionary. And for me, when you break these racial rules by being angry at injustice, to me, this explains a lot. So one of the things that it explains, it explains how, how rage, how anger challenges racial domination and why it's necessary. It explains why certain people's anger is considered a threat, why it's criticized, and why it's often misunderstood. It explains, more importantly to me, while I think that there are resistant figures even among us in this particular room, because there are people in this room that break these rules every, every day, even though we don't know them by name. Okay, last but not least. The last case I wanna make is the case that we can manage, we can cultivate this particular rage. And I think it happens by embracing certain kinds of, of techniques. And allow me to kind of talk about some kind of traditional techniques that are usually involved when it comes to anger and, and philosophical thinking. Um, so the, the, the management of anger is kind of something that we as human beings have been trying to figure out for a long time. And we have kind of the Western um, Roman and, and Greek tradition here. And there's been suggestions on how to manage anger. So we have Sextius, for example, believe that we should engage in kind of self-examination. Um, Seneca, um, he believed, you know, that we should practice avoidance therapy. If something makes you angry, just don't go near it, <laughs> right? Um, there's people who's been kind of, arc you know, recommending meditation. So Seneca, I think the closest thing to that kind of notion, Seneca's turned anger into its opposite. Um, 
there's been a suggestion to kind of break the pattern so when you're angry, do something else. And there's an ancient who basically suggested, you know, say your ABCs. And then kind of more recently, this notion of like group kind of therapy. And so, for example, uh, the ancients Galen um, suggested that we always have someone walk with us. And just in case we get angry, they'll correct us and remind us. Um, even at night, they suggest this notion that when you go to bed, you know, you think about everything that's made you, made you angry and just remember of who you, want, who you want to be. So this notion of having a moral critic and having certain kind of reminders around you. So there's a, there's a, a, a large tradition of, of how to manage your anger, which is just that's that people have been afraid of anger forever. So these are some of, some of the techniques. Now you might say, well, okay, let's, you know, let's use some of these techniques to make sure that our loading and rage is, is, is powerful. I don't have a problem with that. But I do have a problem, <laughs> right? And I think that these suggestions that have been used in the literature may not be enough, may not really be sufficient in really handling the loading and rage that I'm talking about. Because all of these suggestions that I just kind of mentioned gives us ways to kind of ignore it, um, decrease its intensity, or think about something else. But it doesn't focus on, well, how do I make my loading and rage? How do I keep it motivational? How do I keep it resistant? Right? And I want to give some suggestions on how to do that. I also think that if we follow the, the techniques, the historical techniques, I think they're going to get a, in the way of the features that I just aligned, or I just laid out. Well, how so? Well, if we should do what Seneca suggested, where we just avoid whatever makes us angry. Well, if we avoid everything, which is impossible to do for one, if we avoid everything, we would never be motivated or productive in our anger. So I, that's not a good suggestion. If we try to distract ourselves from what's going on, like all the time, I'm not just saying that there's no healthy forms of distractions. I engage in them all the time. As I was telling the group earlier today, I have lots of hobbies, and hobbies keep me sane. Um, but even those have its limits, right? So, you know, distracting techniques, if we decide to do that all the time, it's going to distract us away from what we should actually be paying attention to. I mean, we don't want to be completely ignorant, right, about what's going on. So that's not going to work. Also, it seems like these techniques, they work for, like, interpersonal cases, but not kind of larger social political cases, right? So for example, you know, it's less likely that I can avoid you know, fellow political members. I mean, even if you work with coworkers, that's problematic. I mean, you can quit your job, but you, know, you won't have any money. Right? So avoidance is not always an option. Right? And we can't avoid political citizens. I mean, you could be extreme and, and go and you know, do a homestead, you know, but not everybody has, can do that. We also can't avoid being in the community with other people. Right? Even if we decide to quit our jobs, we can't avoid being in community with others. So those techniques are not going to work. So let me just give you an alternative plan, my alternative plan, and then we can get to the Q&A. So if you have loading a rage, and you want to try to you know, figure out how to keep it motivational, how to keep it resistant, how to keep it you know, as a response to kind of respond to the value of other people's lives, then express it. And I know this seems simple, but it's so very important. And expression was so important. Because one of the things that it does, it helps with our own well-being. Right. Suppressing is not going to do anything to make us better. Right. It only causes more problems. So expressing it helps in, the, you know, in making sure that our well-being is taken care of. And to kind of you know, back that up, when we think about Audre Lorde, the only problem when she talks about anger in her essays, the only problem that she illuminates is when she talks about unexpressed anger. You go back to a, a quote here. Um, she simply suggests that anger is only self-destructive when the kind of anger that we've been talking about is only self-destructive when, when we keep it bottled up. Going back to her, her quote, my response to racism is anger. That anger has eaten cleps into my living only when it remained unspoken. Right? Here's another quote. You're never really a whole person if you remain silent because there's always that one little piece inside you that wants to be spoken out. And if you keep ignoring it, it gets madder and madder. If you don't speak it out, it would just jump up and punch you in the mouth from the inside. For James Baldwin, he thought that this unexpressed anger is not only self-destructive, but it can just be destructive about the people that, and, and directed towards people that we are in solidarity with and in community with. 
And he writes, and he's talking about kind of a reflection on black folks in Harlem. So he says he, we can basically say they, can more or less accept it with an absolute, inarticulate, and dangerous rage inside. And then he says, it's all the more dangerous because it is never expressed. And he's talking about anger here. So we got to express it. Ajua continues, I've seen situations where white women hear racist remarks, become filled with fury, remain silent because they are afraid that unexpressed anger lies within them like an undetonated device, usually to be hurled at the first woman of color who talks about racism. Right? She's talking about kind of displacement when it comes to unexpressed anger. So we got to express it. Another thing that we need to do um, is to improve our, our, what I call kind of racial emotional intelligence. All right. And what does that entail? Well, being very careful that we don't judge the productivity or unproductivity or the good or bad of other people's emotions simply based on their race. Well, what else is racial emotional intelligence? We listen to what their anger is about and not just the fact that they're angry or the intensity of the anger or the way that they express the anger. We were talking about this earlier today in Q&A. Right? Not everybody expresses emotions in the same way. And as opposed to telling people how they ought to act or how they ought to respond, we ought to just listen to what their anger is about as opposed to the expression itself. Being careful not to tone police and also getting comfortable with being uncomfortable with other people's emotions. Okay, and last but not least, be very careful when we are on, the, you know, when we are angry, making sure that we resist people who try to tone police us, who try to silence our, our anger. Well, how do you do it? Here are three suggestions. Recognize a difference between a moral critic who's just gonna hold you accountable and making sure that you don't shoot up the place. That's a very different person from someone who's trying to police your anger and recognizing the difference between the two. Like Audre Lorde, remember that anger is useful. And if you have Lordian rage, <laughs> and you remember this, refuse to give it up as, as a result. Audre Lorde says, in recognition of these three things, she says, black women are expected to use our anger only in the service of other people's salvation or learning. And then she writes, but that time is over. My anger has meant pain to me, but it's also meant survival. And before I give it up, before you give it up, I'm going to make, make sure that there is something at least as powerful to replace it on the road to clarity. Our Lord never says there's anything as powerful as it, so she's not going to give it up. And then there's a reminder of a quote that we had just a few slides ago. Everything can be used except what is wasteful. You would need to remember this when you are accused of destruction by those who are trying to silence your, your anger. Looking forward to the Q&A. It is now time for the question and answer session. Because this event is being recorded, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to reach you before asking your question. We reserve the first questions for students, and then we will open up to the rest of the audience. We will now take the first question. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very insightful. How do I, as a student, when I have anger, how can I use that and express that in a way that doesn't immediately get me shut down for being disrespectful? And, oh, she's just a kid. Of course she's going to be angry. Thank you so much for your question. So one of the things that I would say, and this is some of the echoes of some of the things that I was talking to students earlier, is that in answering your question, I want to speak to everyone who will usually typically respond to you in that particular way. That I will hope that people that are in this room because they heard this talk, <laughs> and they'll recognize uh, and understand that anger has its varieties, that there are good kinds, there are productive kinds. And as I just alluded to in the last part of the talk about anger management, being very careful of how we judge other people's emotions, right? 
I would say that I hope that people in this room are armed with the tools and armed with the principles to make sure that the next time they respond to a student's anger, that they respond to it with the insight, perhaps, that they glean from this talk, so much so that you don't have to work so hard not to be shut down. That's my hope. So I don't want the challenge to be on you. I want the challenge to be on us. And that can only come about by educating ourselves and getting comfortable again with being uncomfortable. And disrespectful is always, you know, iffy. Um, because people have their standards about what disrespect is. And as I kind of alluded to in the talk, when I talk about value, respect, and anger, typically, you know, and I'm just going to say this in general, I'm not saying anything about how students feel about, how teachers feel about students, um, but a lot of behavior that we claim as being disrespectful usually comes under the notion that the person who is acting for respect has no right for, to it. And therefore, their even claims to be respected is disrespectful. And so before we use that word again to describe the actions and behaviors of those around us, we need to inquire about why we think such behavior is respectful or disrespectful. Hi, Professor Terry. I just want to thank you again for coming to talk to us. Um, I wanted to ask, how has rage helped you in your life? Um, and that could be in your writing or your teaching, but I guess in, in your own life. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Um, I'm always angry, I mean, um, so it's helped me a lot. I'm very successful, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Ooh, it increased my self-belief, made me optimistic, made me less risk averse. Um, it's interesting because I, you know, I'm, I'm, I also played sports growing up, and, and so I've, I've seen how it has fueled me in that domain as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I must say, I want to, I'm like a, I want to be very careful to say this. Give, let me say more. I'm like Michael Jordan, okay? No, no, I'm not going to stop there. <laughs> you know the documentary where he says, and I took that personal? I'm that, I'm, I'm, I'm that person. <laughs> Don't let me take anything personal, right? It, it fused me, right? It fused me. Um, so I think even in my own private life, you know, people who have discounted me, disrespected me, that has always been fuel. Um, I mean, of course, my response to that is not, I don't feel good about that. My response to that is anger. But that anger has always, always fueled me. Um, and always gave me an increasing, increasing confidence. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that's what I'll what I say without getting too, too personal. I'm going to stop there because I may just start talking too much about my own personal life. I already had a, ther a therapy session with the student today. I don't want to have it on, on, on video. <laughs> I mean, I also wrote this book because I'm angry. I mean, the anger, you know, fueled this book. Um, and all oppositions to the book getting published, right? It, it, it motivated me, gave me, you know, increased confidence. So, yeah. Hi, Professor Cherry. Thank you so much again for Thank this for talk. Um, what a wonderful way to spend the evening. Um, I was wondering about your views on how positive anger relates to necessarily violence, I guess. How, what connects to violence? A anger yeah. can connect to violence in, yeah. in whatever school of thought that is in your theory. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I was concerned about when writing this book is that I wanted to try to get the reader's mind, or at least get the reader to stop necessarily connecting violence with rage or with anger. And the tendency to do so is so, so simple. I mean, you go back to the previous quote that I highlighted with Jonathan Haidt, saying that anger comes with an inkling. I don't believe that, right? Because there's a lot of times I've been angry, I've not engaged, you know, talking about how anger hurts me personally, I have not engaged in any physical acts of attack or humiliation. Um, and so um, I wanted to kind of disentangle our thinking about that without making a commentary on if violence is ever necessary. I mean, that's, a, that's another issue. But I want to disentangle the two. 
Also, if you really go into the literature, I mean, if you really want to be geeky about it, anger is not the emotion of attacking, right? Um, I want to say fear. Um, it's another emotion I can't think of right now, but it ain't mine, <laughs> it ain't my anger. My, my, it, it's not anger. Um, so I wanted to, I want, that's just so much evidence to back that up, all right? I also, <laughs> And I echo this throughout the book, is that this anger made me do it kind of excuse is ridiculous. I, I believe in the agency of human beings. We make decisions about what we do and suggest that anger is the thing that made me do it. I think it's, it's, it's not an accurate story about our actions and what leads to our particular actions. So I don't think the two are necessarily connected because there's just been a lot of times that people feel angry and they have no desire to engage in any violence whatsoever, right? I get mad at my sister all the time. I never have a desire to be like, you know what, I'm gonna drive to Mississippi. I'm gonna slash her tire. I mean, it's just, <laughs> right? Um, so I just wanted to connect that, disconnect that. And there's just other literature to suggest that there's other emotions that really, really has an influence on, on, on physical, on, on violence. Um, and I think once we begin to see that they're not necessarily related, I think that's going to change our perspective about its usefulness and its place in our, in our, in our lives. Uh, uh, thank you again, Professor. Peter, uh, is that your name? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just had a quick question because you brought up about how we continue these kind of conversations, but I was wondering about how we can start them, especially earlier on. You know, here we are at college, but it would seem, at least from personal experience, as though the anger, the stigma behind it tends to be institutionalized or instilled at a very young age. So how can we sort of refrain from doing that now? Like, what actions would you personally take? Get people to buy my book. <laughs> I mean, as an educator, it's education. And I think, I think there are rules, there are norms, there's, a, there's ways of thinking that a lot of us have, have learned, right? And as much as I've been talking about, about, about feeling rules, there's just norms around the kinds of emotions that we think in our particular society is worthy, is useful, et cetera. I mean, I think that's an ongoing thing. Um, and I think we need to educate ourselves out of that kind of thinking. And the way that we can educate ourselves is having what we learn today and sharing that with other individuals and also just sharing literature, such as my book, with other people so that they can learn their way out of that kind of, kind of thinking. And even if you don't agree with my argument, wouldn't it be fun to have an interesting conversation with someone about my arguments from my book? <laughs> that is supposed to be not so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, don't, I just want the bookstore to just leave here with zero copies, that's all, that's all I'm doing. It's not about me. It's about the bookstore <laughs> and their bottom line. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Awesome thank talk. Um, I wanted to ask what you think is the relationship between rage and hate? Yeah. Uh, if there's productive rage, is there also productive hate? Yeah. Should hate be suppressed and rage used, or is they not, are they not as tied together as people think? Yeah, I like this question. So I think uh, kind of the best way to respond to that, I'm going to go to a wonderful philosophy paper that I read a few years ago. And this is a paper by the philosopher McAllister Bell. And her argument is thus. She says, there's a lot of people who've been arguing for what she calls kind of the instrumental uses of anger, like me. And she says in the paper, what I'm going to argue for is the intrinsic uses for anger. So why is this anger useful, D despite what you're going to get from it, whether that's justice or whatever? How can it just be useful just by being, being angry? And she says, well, I have an answer for that. She says, what anger does is it expresses a love for virtue and a hatred for vice. That's what anger does. So I would suggest that if there's any connection between the kind of anger that I'm talking about, the loading and rage, is that it expresses a love for virtue, a love for justice, a love for all people, and a hatred for vice, and a hatred for injustice, 
and the hatred for inequality. That's what I see the connection is. And that's okay. That's wonderful. We should hate vice. We should hate inequality. We should hate injustice. We have time for probably just one more question. Um, we've heard in recent discourse a lot of people talk about a need to shock people Say it again. into action. We've heard, I feel like it's now very common to hear the phrase that we need to shock people into action in terms of like social and activist movements. What role should rage play? Uh, or anger playing that shocking. What's your answer? All of it. Like, I feel like <laughs> <laughs> with your talk specifically, like, we could rephrase it into angering or anger people into action. Tell me a little bit about the, the shock. What do, what do they typically mean by shock people into action? What does that mean? make them face the injustices. Like when you were talking about empathy and having a lot of people feel the same thing that people who are experiencing the injustices are yeah. feeling it. Um, specifically in racial struggles, it has to do with white people acknowledging, shocking them into facing the reality mm -hmm. of what, what, what black people have to live through every day. Mm -hmm. It's so shocking in a sense, it's just also instilling empathy. Yeah, yeah. I can say a lot about this, but let me, let me try to be brief. And I don't know if this is gonna be a sufficient answer. But there's something about shock that I wonder, when does it, what was once shock becomes the norm? So you think about the time, you know, you got 2012, the murder of Trayvon Martin, and we begin to see kind of these videos of people being shot by the police. And we know that 2020 was like the year that white people got woke, so like <laughs> they begin sending these, seeing these videos, something they'd never seen before, and it's like, oh my God, it's, it's shocking to see that. And now it's to the point that those videos don't even have the power that they once had or that people can watch them on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. And, and I don't have much to say about that regard, but it, it just seems like what was once shock is something that we can eventually become numb to. And so I just wonder about its, its place there. Could be the case, the problem is not necessarily shock itself, but about us and how we relate and respond and get used to trauma. So there's a viral video going around by a wonderful psychologist by the name of uh, Tama Bryant, and she talks about how there are lots of people who, before they go to bed, they watch shows like Law and Order. And she basically asked the question, what is it about trauma that puts you to sleep at night? And I think with all the communication that we get and all the access of information that we get, sometimes it becomes shocking, but then eventually we get used to it and our emotions become numb to it. And when you're numb to it, there's no action that's gonna be, going be taken. And so the challenge is, and this is more of a question, is how do we make sure that our emotional reactions are always attuned to the severity and the intensity of suffering without becoming numb or used to it? That's the challenge. This concludes tonight's presentation. Please join me in thanking Professor Cherry. Thank you all so much. I think I will be signing books at the table outside, okay. <laughs>